finally, it should also be noted that signals can and have been relayed through space. Radio frequencies that go all the way up to 60 gigahertz reach what is called the oxygen absorption band. Meaning that our planet's thick atmosphere effectively absorbs the electromagnetic waves. In fact, the US government takes full advantage of this for use in covert satellite to satellite communications. <sighs> Radio frequencies in a narrow band around 60 gigahertz, not up to 60 gigahertz, are attenuated by oxygen because that happens to be the resonant frequency of oxygen molecules. Theoretically, an Earth-orbiting Apollo craft could have transmitted these 60 gigahertz signals to an unmanned translunar craft. This vehicle could repeat the signal it received, but at 2 gigahertz. To prevent the inevitable blackout that would occur when the CSM went behind the Earth, a geosynchronous relay satellite would be required to repeat or reflect Apollo's signal to the translunar probe. Because the original signal can't penetrate the atmosphere, never would anyone know that the translunar signals were in fact relayed from Earth orbit. Even though 60 gigahertz satellite crosslinks were being conceptualized in the late 60s, the U.S. military was still investigating this new technology in 1978. And even though the Milstar series, which began development in 1982, was designed to use 60 gigahertz crosslinks, the first Milstar satellite wasn't launched until 1994. Also, linking up modern satellites reliably on 60 gigahertz at one-fifth the distance to the moon is a challenge. So putting this technology on a satellite in 1969 is an anachronism. Nevertheless, let's test Jarrah's theory that NASA used this frequency to bounce messages off an unmanned translunar spacecraft by playing What Would I Do If I Were a Conspirator? Well, whether you use 2 gigahertz or 60 gigahertz, it's a directional signal. If you have a satellite in Earth orbit and it transmits to a satellite in lunar orbit, it really wouldn't matter which frequency you use because nobody on Earth would be able to intercept the directional signal. The lunar satellite would require two separate radio systems and two high-gain antennas. The 2 gigahertz system actually used by the Apollo's command surface module could probably do both jobs, communication with the Earth orbiting satellite and Earth base stations using only one radio antenna combo. The beam width for a 60 gigahertz system would be narrower as both the source and target would be moving, pointing could be problematic. Actually, regardless of which frequency you would use, if you lose your radio lock between the two satellites, you then have two moving satellites, 385,000 kilometers apart, that would have to search for each other. The wider beam width of the 2 gigahertz system would make this exercise much easier. The only real advantage the 60 gigahertz system would offer would be that to achieve the same gain at the same transmitting power as with the 2 gigahertz system, you could use a dish at only one-fifth the diameter. And since 60 gigahertz communications was essentially an emerging technology in the 60s, it was brand new, I would opt to use the time-tested 2 gigahertz equipment. Why mess around with cutting-edge technology when you have something proven that will do the job with less risk and at less cost? It doesn't make sense, does it? Again, Jera picked a non-optimum solution. So, we've shown that if Jodrell Bank was the only independent source that could possibly prove the Apollo program was a fake, it would make more sense to simply pay them off than to actually send a spacecraft to the moon just to fool them. And if NASA were going to use cutting-edge technology to prevent eavesdropping on their relay transmissions to an unmanned spacecraft, why not use that cutting-edge technology to simply put men on the moon? Ciao, moon hoax conspirators, wherever you are.